So Kyoto lies now very sadly behind us, but this morning we got onto a train and we traveled deep into the hinterland and more specifically into the mountainous parts of Japan. So we find ourselves this morning in Takayama. Why Takayama? Apart from one thing, it's full of history. Well, it's the answer is it's the autumn festival. Twice a year, they bring out some very precious floats that they've had since, oh, I think about the the year 880 or something, and it's a big thing. So we're hoping, even with the rainy conditions around us, that we're going to see something of a very, very special procession. And we're in the mountains, and there are bells all over Japan, but up here, they sound more like cow bells. Trying to travel light, we're sort of succeeding by wrapping everything in baggage, but let me tell you, when you are traveling from train to train to train, it is by no means a doddle. But so far, so good. This one's looking dodgier and dodgier. We are in Takayama and we're going to be staying in a, a private sort of B&B guest lodge guest lodge, that's too strong a term, house. We'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm afraid that's it. This will be a new experience. <laughs> it's the second day of the autumn festival and we're in the area, or the town of Takayama. And this is one of the most sacred festivals to Japan. These floats behind me, some of them date back to about the year 800. They're made mainly out of wood, which is the specialist skill of this particular area. So yesterday, day one, the heavens opened and the floats had to be rushed back into safety. was covered up the minute the first rain started and I'm guessing this is the one that's their most precious which dates back to about 880 AD. The woodwork on this is beautiful. Each individual float, we've discovered, has its own little car park. They don't all group them together. So we're following this one through the streets of Takayama. Uh-oh, traffic jam. Here comes the rain. Quite element of panic. From the second we walked into this doorway, we were welcomed with such warm hospitality, primarily due to this gentleman, Luke. Tell you what, we're used to hearing Japanese, so we go in ready with our greetings. And we get this delightful Irish accent coming across the counter, then to absolute amazement, properly switched over to Japanese. This is Luke, who seems to be the, the center of this place. Yeah. Luke's been living here for about a year now, so he sort of fronts the place. So let's show you what's, what else lies around here. There's a sort of common lounge area where, in the evenings in particular, everybody who's staying here comes and has a cup of tea or plays a round of cards or something, and it's all very, very convivial and remarkably tranquil. This is a bit like one of those spot the difference games that you play. This is Marisaki in 1925. This is Marisaki in 2023. Well, I challenge you to find the difference because I can't. Okay, this one's a bit different. In Takayama. <laughs> And this is where we are. And the husband 
and the luggage. <laughs> we are certainly experiencing all aspects of Japanese hospitality. We are now officially in the Japanese Alps, specifically an area called Kamikachi, which is this whole gorge in front of us. And behind me is the Kappa Bashi, which is the Kappa Bridge. And as you can see, it's a very popular destination yeah, for tourists, but mainly for Japanese people as well. And the Hakatu mountain range, which I think is the third highest mountain part, is all behind me. From here begins multiple hikes. It's an incredible jewel of the Japanese Alps. We are surrounded by what is clearly hikers. There's backpacks everywhere and walking sticks and all sorts of things. But the interesting thing, you can see the avalanche path behind me over there, is that even though this is a hiking area, in a very short time from now, about three weeks from now, this whole area closes down for winter and doesn't wake up again until April. But as the tourist books say, you can still come to Kamikachi. You just have to get here by snowshoe. This gentleman sitting here is Narumi, who actually owns this establishment and he's also <laughs> our chef. We always land up hiking. I don't know what's wrong with us, but here we are. Three kilometers of hiking up the hills to find the folk village. Oh, that was a big climb, but somewhere behind the trees, is our destination today. We've just done a hike up the mountain, exactly 3.7 kilometers from where we're staying to this place. We must have been mad to go straight up the mountain, but we did it. And at the top of the mountain is this. It's the Hida Folk Museum. It's an open air museum. And no, it didn't always exist like this as a village, but they apparently brought real houses from within the Edo period from all over the district. And they brought it and recreated a village as it would have been, but the houses are the real thing. And the emphasis is on crafts. And what I do know is about Takayama in particular, where we're staying, they're known for wood to the point that way back in Edo, they were exempt from taxes to make sure that the profession and the skills remained in Japan. Eating a little bit differently tonight. We've tried all sorts of Japanese food, um, fantastic sushi, loads of ramen, which this area is also known for. But tonight, we've gone into a Takayama French restaurant, which is in the Michelin Guide, treating ourselves. And their speciality is a specific form of beef, which is not what you're looking at. That's my order of salmon. But the rest of the restaurant is all about this. This is called Hida beef. It's kind of in the same category as Wagyu, except they separate the cattle off, apparently, to keep them hidden. They're very proud of the specific type of cattle. And it's very specialized, and it's A5 level, and ridiculously expensive. But this is what the area is known for, so Hida beef is the thing to have, and we are finally having it. 